Good morning. If you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12, I'll be reading from Matthew 12, verses 38 through 45. And uh, today we uh, had our, our study. We were in the book of uh, Kings and Chronicles looking at Solomon and Solomon and, and all of his glory and splendor. It's a lot about Solomon in Matthew's gospel, Uh, going back to the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of David, Jesus being the son of David, that's one of the titles used in Matthew, and again, that uh, you think of Solomon, uh, but Jesus here in Matthew chapter 12 teaches that he is greater than Solomon, so for all the emphasis on David and Solomon in Matthew's gospel, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 12 and verse 6 that he is one who is greater than the temple, so Solomon is the the glory of the old covenant kingdom and the building of the temple. Uh, Jesus, of course, will later teach, uh, destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. And we'll be reading now from Matthew 12 about uh, Jesus uh, being greater, how the Queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth to hear the, the wisdom of Solomon, uh, but that one greater and wiser than Solomon uh, was <clears throat> in their midst. Another thing to keep in mind about Solomon and Jesus being greater than Solomon is in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus was tempted he was offered all of the the glory right there's a lot of glory and we'll be focusing on glory he was offered by the devil all of the glory and the splendor of the kingdoms of this world on one condition if you bow down and worship me that's what Satan said and and Jesus said depart from me you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve, right? So he's quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. When, when Solomon was offered all of the glory of the kingdoms of this world, God promised that to him, but instead he bowed down, and he bowed down through his 700 marriages that he had and the alliances, the building of the high places, uh, and the building of many other things. So the, the Old Testament is always looking forward to one greater than David, one greater than Solomon, and that is... Uh, what is explained here in Matthew 12, and I'll be reading verses 38 through 45, and may God give us eyes to see the the glory of uh, God's kingdom as Jesus taught us to pray. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, Something greater than Solomon is here. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That, that is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 5. So we've been reading through the Bible. We, uh, we're in First Chronicles and... Uh, the opening chapters of Second Chronicles and also First Kings. So looking at uh, David, as David had purchased the threshing floor of Arania the Jebusite. That's how Second Samuel ends. Uh, and after he does that, and this is in the, uh, the book of Chronicles, he makes uh, a lot of preparations in First Chronicles. So First Chronicles is also about the life of David. And there are about eight chapters devoted to David's Preparation of the Levites is ordering of the gatekeepers, the musicians, um, when the Levites would come to the temple and serve. And then First Chronicles ends the last verses with David's death, and then there's the transition in Second Chronicles to 
uh, Solomon and his reign. So David, may, he couldn't build the temple because he was a man of war. We just sang about that in Psalm 144 because of the, the blood on his hands. But it was Solomon, whose name means peace, and Solomon was the, the great temple builder. And this is part of God's covenant with David. So God had made a covenant with David that he would have a forever heir, a descendant on his throne, the throne of his kingdom forever, and that his son would build a house for his name. So Solomon uh, was the, the builder, looking forward to the greater son of David, uh, who would build his house, Jesus, who now sits at the right hand of God the Father. So I'll be reading from Second Chronicles 5, and uh, this is the account of the completion of the temple and the Ark of the Covenant being brought, placed in the Holy of Holies, and then the priests uh, coming out of the temple. And our focus will be on glory. Uh, we opened uh, singing Psalm 8 about how God created us and how he crowned us with glory and majesty. Uh, one of the, the saddest verses of the Bible is Romans 3, where Paul is summarizing the Old Testament, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you think of Adam and how he was made for glory. He was the, the crown and glory of creation, but because of our first parents' sin, they, they fall off that precipice, that, that cliff of glory, and uh, they inherit death. God gave a promise, though, of redemption, and that promise of redemption that we've been tracing then from Genesis 3, and now we're in uh, First and Second Chronicles, um, is that the seed of the woman would crush to the head of the serpent, and now we are in Jerusalem, and we have the building of God's house. So we have the continuation of God's covenant in the time of David and Solomon with uh, a wonderful emphasis on glory. And this glory anticipated the glory of Jesus in the new covenant, the one who is greater than Solomon and greater than the temple. So I'd like to read from Second Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. And then I'll be reading from uh, chapter 6 and verse 40 through chapter 7 and verse 3. And again, um, we'll be focusing on uh, the glory of God as it was associated with the Davidic covenant. Second Chronicles 5 beginning in verse 1. Thus all the work that Solomon performed for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and all the utensils, and put them in the treasuries of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled to Jerusalem the elders of Israel, and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers, households of the sons of Israel, to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the men of Israel assembled themselves to the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. Then all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. They brought up the ark and the tent of meeting, and all the holy utensils which were in the tent, the Levitical priests brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him before the ark were sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the house to the Holy of Holies under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the Ark so that the cherubim made a covering over the Ark and its poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles of the ark could be seen in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen outside, and they are there to this day. There is nothing in the ark except the two tablets which Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of Egypt. When the priests came forth from the holy place for all the priests, who were present, had sanctified themselves without regard to divisions, and all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, Jejuthin, and their sons and kinsmen, clothed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, standing east of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets. In unison, when the trumpeters and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice, to praise and to glorify the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and when they praised the Lord, saying, 
He indeed is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. In chapter 6, Solomon has the prayer of dedication, and we'll be picking up in chapter 6 and verse 40, the conclusion of Solomon's prayer and God's answer to Solomon's prayer and the confirmation from heaven that indeed that covenant now rested with David and Solomon. So in uh, verse 40, Now, O my God, I pray, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let your godly ones rejoice in what is good. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember your loving kindness to your servant David. Now, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. All the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, Truly, he is good. Truly, his loving kindness is everlasting. And let us pray. Lord, it is our worship in the new covenant and our confession that your chesed, your loving kindness, is everlasting. We thank you for the revelation of that grace, that steadfast love, uh, in the promise uh, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Uh, We thank you for that loving kindness being manifested at Mount Sinai, uh, even when Israel had committed the great abomination and the worship of the golden calf. We thank you as Moses asked now, Lord, show me your glory. We thank you that you showed Moses the glory of your being a God who judges iniquity, transgression, and sin, but also being a God who shows mercy and compassion and steadfast love, that chesed. And we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ that you are that perfect revelation. We thank you that that chesed was celebrated and remembered in the time of Solomon, but we thank you for the fulfillment of it in this age in which we now live. So we ask, O Lord, as as Moses prayed, that you would show us your glory. We thank you how Moses and Elijah saw that glory in the Mount of Transfiguration. We thank you how the apostles uh, and the New Testament church saw that glory in your resurrection and how they saw that glory on Pentecost as the fire came down from heaven. And we pray that that glory would continue to be seen in your church and your people and that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord would cover the earth, even as the waters cover the sea. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the key themes and words of the Bible is glory. And R.C. Sproul is an overview of the Bible, and part of the title of R.C.'s book is From Dust to Creation to the Glory of Revelation. And it's a wonderful title, From the Dust of Creation So you think of the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and how we were created from dust. We sang about that in Psalm 8. But we have been crowned with glory and majesty because we have been made in the image of God. Of course, all have sinned. We have fallen from that glory back into death. But not just death, but judgment. There's an everlasting judgment. Uh, But that is not the end of the story from dust to glory to dust. Uh, there is the continuation of that story to the glory of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. But right now we're in the the time period of the the Bible as we've been reading through the Bible and the revelation of God's dust to glory and that dust to glory in the time of David and Solomon and the Davidic covenant. We uh, mentioned in our class this morning, if you read the book of Chronicles, the first Uh, Approximately nine chapters of uh, Chronicles is a genealogy, and it's a genealogy that begins with Adam. So the first word of Chronicles is Adam. 
And you think of Adam and everything he lost, that dust. But what the chronicler is doing is he's looking then, and you look at the genealogy and some of the tribes are skipped over, and the focus of the genealogy is on the Levites, you know, the, the temple, the musicians. Uh, the focus is on Judah. There, there are more vo uh, verses to the genealogy of Judah than any of the other tribes. And it's anticipating that, that glory that would be found through David's greater son, Jesus. And remember that the book of Chronicles was written after Solomon's temple had been destroyed when there was no king. So there's this expectation of the coming of the king. Glory is one of the key themes of the scriptures, and it's the key theme of all good theology. Think of how the Westminster Shorter Catechism begins, right? What is the chief end of man? A man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Well, a lot of people forget that it's not just the first question that deals with glory. The very last question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, number 107, is about glory. So the catechism closes with the Lord's Prayer, and question 107 uh, asks uh, about the, the Lord's Prayer and reminds us that in the Lord's Prayer we are taught to pray, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, the second question of the Shorter Catechism, what rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. Um, some of the younger children in our congregation who um, are just learning to speak, you might ask them the question, as I do, um, you know, who made you? You know, and their ears will perk up, you know, say, who made you? And they're, all right, they'll say, God made you, right? And then you say, well, what else did God make? And you say, God made everything. Now that some of my kid, uh, grandkids are stuck on the next question I ask, why did God make you in all things? For his own, and it's hard to say glory. You know, they might say something like, whoa -y or, um, but that's, that's, that's the best theology that you could teach. And I, I want to commend the Shorter Catechism to parents, if you're thinking, which one? I, I teach at a, another school, and some people are saying, we don't want the Westminster Catechism anymore. We want the new catechism, uh, the new city catechism. And I'm like, you have no clue what you're losing out on. <laughs> you're losing out on so much. You really, it's the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, we talked about this on uh, Thursday. It was written at the apex of the Reformation. So you have the best thinkers, the best theologians who have been thinking about theology in light of the Reformation for about 150 years, just to round up. And we live in a period in which there's been a decline of theology, and we don't have the kind of theologians that we had back in the 17th century. And so you have people coming along and they think, let's rewrite Westminster because we can do a better job because it's less wordy or you know, I, whatever the, the excuse is given, there is no excuse. Um, but you won't find anything better. This is, the catechism is a wonderful summary of the scriptures, and, it re, and I want to remind you and commend you to that and that emphasis on the glory of God. This is a sola deo gloria. Right? This is good, solid, reformed theology. R.C. Sproul wrote that when we read the scriptures, we are reading a book that is unfolding on every page a divine purpose for your existence and for mine, for his own glory. God created Adam from the dust and the woman from Adam's rib for his own glory. They fell from that glory. There's a return back to dust. And really every page of the Bible after is about God's restoration through redemption of the glory from the dust of sin, the wrath that sin brings about to the glory of redemption. Think of Moses and what we've studied of Moses. One of the key words for understanding the, those um, covenant at Mount Sinai is glory. In Exodus 33, there's a wonderful prayer as, as Moses is acting as a, a mediator, the old covenant mediator um, in the light of Israel's sin and their transgression and the work, worshiping of the golden calf. And Moses makes a wonderful prayer. Show me your glory. You know, that's what I want to see. Now, now Moses met with God face to face, right? And, and he spoke with God as one speaks with a friend. But what is Moses pursuing in his life? Show me your glory. And I believe that was a prayer that was answered in part when Jesus was transfigured in the Gospels. When the tabernacle was finished, the book of Exodus ends with 
glory. So as you look at how books end in the, the scriptures, it's very important. In Exodus chapter 40, after the tabernacle was constructed, uh, and it's a beautiful account of that construction modeled on uh, the seven days of creation, the six days of creation, the one day of rest, it is written, then the cloud. Now listen carefully, this is very important. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It, that is an amazing passage when you think about it. Aaron the high priest couldn't go in and minister. Aaron's sons couldn't go in and minister. In fact, they tried going in in Leviticus 10 in an unauthorized way, unauthorized uh, fire, the strange fire, and they died. So Aaron had other, two other sons. Uh, the Levites couldn't go in when the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Not even Moses could go in. Now Moses did speak with God face to face. When he came out of the tabernacle, we learned that after speaking with God, he would have to cover his face with a veil. And there was a, a fading glory. But the glory at the very end of the book of Exodus was such that not even Moses, the, the one who received the instructions for the building of the tabernacle, who, who spoke with God face to face, not even he could go into the tabernacle. And this glory cloud then continued to follow Israel all the way to the promised land. So Israel and the old covenant, they dwelt in tents as they came out of Egypt. God then built his tent. That's what the tabernacle was in the midst of his people. And God in his glory moved into the neighborhood of Israel. One of the key words as we now come to the, the age of Solomon and what you have in Solomon's day you have the Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai, and there is a transition. It's the same covenant of grace, but now there's a transition from Moses to David and Solomon. And it's a transition from Mount Sinai to Jerusalem. It's a transition from the uh, Ark of the Covenant being placed in the Holy of Holies. Now the Ark of the Covenant is being taken out of the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, and it is being brought into the temple in Jerusalem, into the Holy of Holies. And really, all uh, we're not getting to Solomon's fall yet. So um, there are many faults with Solomon. We're, we're going we're gonna to be at the peak for right now. All right. Um, in Solomon's day, Solomon's day, everything that's associated with his early ministry is glory. Think of Jesus when he's teaching us not to worry. You know, Jesus says, look at the lilies of the, of the valley, right? And look at their glory and their splendor. And he says, not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of these flowers. Not even Solomon, right? That's the ancestor of Jesus, right? Now, Jesus, of course, had far greater riches than Solomon, right? He's the eternal son of God. He took upon himself flesh and blood. But Jesus, the one greater than Solomon, the one who is, is worshipped by the angels and, and deserving of all glory and honor and wisdom, he is the one now speaking in that poverty of his humiliation, said, remember Solomon, right? He's speaking about his ancestor. But Solomon, in all of the glory days of, the, of kings and chronicles, and all of that wealth, think of all of the economic wealth, that silver, there's so much silver in Solomon's day that it wasn't of any value. Solomon is bringing in, and with other nations, he's bringing in the wealth of the nations to Jerusalem. He has a navy of ships. He's building mines in other parts of the world. So he's bringing all the wealth of the nations to Jerusalem. And Jesus said, though, that not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of these. Uh, this amazingly is spoken by one who is on his way to the cross where he would die with no clothing. Everything, there's a forsakenness of the greater son of God. So as we've been reading through the Bible, Solomon is the Old Testament type of the king's glory. Like Adam, there are many, many kings have glory, right? They're, they're, it's an outward glory. But of all the, the splendor of the Old Testament, all, as you think about glory and the glory of different kingdoms uh, in the different ages of the world, Solomon is that great type. He is the one foreshadowing and anticipating Jesus, the king of glory. Now, as you read on in Kings and Chronicles, Adam fell, Solomon fell from that glory, but we are in a period of time in which there is the wisdom 
of glory, right? So Solomon prays for wisdom, and he is granted that wisdom. Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 4 speaks 3,000 Proverbs, so that'll be one of the next books that we read in two months. We'll be reading through the book of Proverbs. He spoke 1,005 songs. Uh, We'll be reading one of those songs uh, when we read this month through the Song of Solomon. We'll be singing one of those psalms when we sing this afternoon from Psalm 72. Solomon's fame and glory was such, and it's, it's again, it's the glory of the Lord. So it's, it's God's glory and wisdom that is given to Solomon. Um, Solomon will ch- seek another kind of glory, right, when he bows down uh, to other gods. But the, God is that source of, of glory, and, and that was seen for a short period of time in Solomon's ministry. Men came from all the peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. You think of the glory of Solomon in dominion. When I was a biology major, 1 Kings 4.33 was, I loved this verse. Solomon spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke also of animals and birds and creeping things and fish. So he speaks of these things just like Adam, right? He's given dominion, and God brought the animals before Adam, and he named them. Now there's a, a, a second. A, he's not the second Adam. It's Jesus, but he's looking forward to that. Now these animals are brought before Solomon, and he's speaking his wisdom, and he's expounding upon all of these creatures. And uh, being a herpetologist, I love the creeping things that he would describe. And he has things about lizards in the book of Proverbs and how you'll find lizards even upon the walls of kings. So everyone would say they would go to Solomon and they would listen to that wisdom. In 1 Kings chapter 10, he had the sea of ships of Tarshish with the ships of Hiram. And once every three years, the ships of Tarshish, and we sing about those in Psalm 72, they came bringing gold and silver and ivory and apes and peacocks. It's kind of like Noah's Ark, isn't it? So you have these arcs of Noah, but it's not a flood of judgment now that's coming from heaven. It's the glory of Messiah that is now coming down from heaven. It's the wealth of nations that's flooding Jerusalem. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. The queen of Sheba came from the south. And Jesus mentions the Queen of Sheba as he is the one greater than Solomon. But in 1 Kings chapter 10, the Queen of Sheba, after visiting and meeting with Solomon, she says, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. You exceeded in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. How blessed are your men! How blessed are these your servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom! And most importantly now, the glory she gives is to God. She says, Blessed be Yahweh your God, who delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel. There's the covenant. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore he made you king to do righteousness and justice. Oh, that's that righteousness and justice we're learning about in Isaiah, isn't it? And about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a great joy reading these accounts of Solomon and the glory of the Old Testament kingdom of God. And the most important thing to remember as you're thinking about glory is its connection with God's glory, God's covenant, God's worship. Because fallen man typically is seeking glory and wisdom and wealth apart from God's commandments, apart from the temple, and apart from the mediatorial dominion of Jesus. But Solomon, at least initially, he sought God's glory by seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Solomon's father also helped him tremendously in this. Uh, If you read through the book of Chronicles, and I've already mentioned this, about eight chapters of Chronicles after David purchases the threshing floor of Arnia, the Jebusite, about the next eight chapters, and it concludes with his death, but everything before David's death is a preparation for the building of the temple. So that when you come to 2 Kings chapter 5, and, the, uh, and again, we're just summarizing the scriptures so that we better understand how to read them and how they point us to Christ. So we, we read in 2 Kings chapter 5 that the tabernacle is bought, brought to, to Jerusalem 
And the priests then bring from the tabernacle the ark into the temple. And in 2 Chronicles 5, which we read from, and this is very important because it should hearken us back to the glory of the, the covenant at Mount Sinai and the glory that filled the tabernacle, right? So you're transitioning from the tabernacle and also creation. I, I don't even have time to talk about the, creation, the, the glory of creation, but this is a new creation. So the tabernacle, right, was filled with glory, but now as the Ark of the Covenant is coming out of the tabernacle and transitioning to the temple, you have all of the, the Levitical priests, the trumpeters, the, the singers, right? They're singing and praising the Lord. Uh, I, I, part of it's Psalm 136, right? His loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness, his compassion, his chesed is everlasting. And then the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud, right? So as there, 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 there is the, the house that was built for the Ark of the Covenant. That's why the temple was built. It was for the Ark of the Covenant, which was placed in the Holy of Holies, where once every um, year on the Day of Atonement, uh, propitiation would be made for the transgression, sin, and iniquity of Israel as that blood, the blood of the covenant, would be placed and sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant containing the moral law of God. That same moral law that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And now they are seeing this work of redemption that the temple was anticipating. And as they are praising God for His perfect justice, his loving kindness, his grace that lasts forever. They are ministering, but the glory of God comes down as a cloud, and the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. You think of the glory of God in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. But now there is a redemptive glory of God being revealed from the tabernacle to the temple. And the priests were not able to minister in the, te the temple, just like in the tabernacle. And then Solomon prays. And as Solomon prays, what happens? At the end of his prayer, fire comes down from heaven, and the glory of the Lord fills the temple. That is a heavenly divine sign, right? In, in Matthew 12, they're looking for signs from heaven, right? There's the sign of Jonah. There will be signs when Jesus dies and rises again from the dead. But what is the sign of God's acceptance of worship? And the worship at the temple, which is anticipating Jesus, who said one here is greater than the temple. It's that glory cloud. It's the fire from heaven. These were God's signs from heaven that the temple was now the resting place for the Ark of the Covenant. And if you want your mind to really be blown at this point, and it, it's so amazing, when the book of Chronicles was being written, it was being written 400 years before Jesus, when there was no Davidic king, and when the second temple had been built and there was no glory. God's glory never filled the second temple after it was built. Or did it? The prophet Haggai makes a promise in the time when the Chronicles is being written. I think it was written by Ezra. I think he's the one that oversaw it. He's the priest, right? So that's why there's so much priestly work. And Haggai in, in Ezra's day says, because the people who had seen the glory of Solomon's temple compared to the temple that was built, they were weeping and crying. It was nothing in comparison. And Haggai says that the glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And you look at that and you're like, how? There's never been any, the, the amount of gold has never been amassed in one place like it was in Solomon's day, or silver, or costly stone, or timber, never uh, like that. But there is a divine glory that Haggai says and God's people were waiting for. And this is why the chronicler, he begins with Adam, and God's people were waiting, they were coming to this temple that God's glory had never visited, and they're saying, where is the glory? Where is the glory? And then in the fullness of time, Jesus was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was born under the law. And where do they take him on the eighth day? To be circumcised. They take him into the temple. And that, when Jesus was taken into the temple, is when that prophecy was fulfilled and would continue to be fulfilled throughout his earthly ministry. You see, Moses and Solomon were builders. 
Jesus is the worker. He is the high priest. He is the holy and unblemished righteous sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' person, in his person, in his person is the eternal son of God. He is glory. He is the glory of God. And as the redeemer, the one who is truly God and truly man, he is the revelation of God's glory. His work, his once for all work, his sacrifice on the cross, when he said, it is finished, remember, as he says and he declares, that is the finishing of his glorious work of redemption. And what happens in the temple is that the, the veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. There will be a transfer of worship, just as there was from Mount Sinai to Jerusalem, and now to the right hand of God, where Jesus sits with all authority in heaven and on earth, the one who is our great high priest. Think now of what the words of Jesus meant in Matthew chapter 26. As he is on his way to the cross, he has already been betrayed by Judas. He has already instituted the celebration of the Lord's Supper. He has already been at Gethsemane where he sweat blood. But it was there that he resolved again to do the will of the Father and going to the cross. And as Jesus stood before the high priest, the high priest said, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his robes and said he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. It would be blasphemy, but it was true. The clouds of heaven, what does that mean in light of everything that we've just read? What are the clouds of heaven? What were the clouds of heaven that the high priest, his ancestor Aaron, saw? What were the clouds of heaven that came down upon the tabernacle? It was the glory of God. What was the cloud of heaven that came down and rested upon Solomon's glorious temple? That the priests, the ancestors of Caiaphas, the high priest, they weren't able to minister. Jesus said, now you will see. He is on his way because that's the whole purpose of the temple. The whole purpose of the temple in Solomon's day is to point us to Christ. That when the glory of God descended on the temple, the priest's work after that glory uh, departed, they could start that work, of, that work of sacrifice, the work of atonement, right? The, all the types and shadows looking forward to the Lamb of God. Jesus is his, on his way to the cross. He's saying, that is all coming to an end. And you will see the glory of the Son of Man. And he will come on power of the clouds of heaven. This is why Paul could write in 1 Corinthians 2. We do not speak wisdom among those who are mature. Oh, wisdom, however, not of this age, not of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom and a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages for our, to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has, has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus is the Lord of glory. I asked, I asked this morning, and, and I don't think anyone got the answer, when Jesus ascended into heaven, when did the fire come down? Was there fire from heaven? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? The fire of God's judgment came down upon Jesus at the cross. That's why there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, there is a future return, and there is a final judgment, the lake of fire. But if you're in Christ, that fire from heaven and that demonstration of the new covenant in Christ's blood, not the old covenant and the blood of Moses, not the old covenant of David and Solomon, right? It's the new covenant in Christ's blood. And on the day of Pentecost, remember that the Spirit of God came down and rested on the disciples as flames of fire. It was another confirmation along with his resurrection that he is the Christ. And now the glory of God, the glory of the redemption, the redemptive work of God is being taken to the ends of the earth. Think of Psalm 24 as we sing. There's a wonderful question, but we now know the answer. Lift your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. 
right? So think of everything that David did and all the preparations for the musicians and the gatekeepers. And now in Psalm 24, God's people were singing about the ascension, right? Open the doors that the king come, can come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Jesus has entered into that glory. He has sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews 1 says that he, Jesus, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Later in Hebrews 9, verse 11, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. The writer of the Hebrews goes on to say, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. There's a, another preposition for you. For us. My body, my blood, for you. So as we're reading through the scriptures, now we're in a time of Solomon. Think of glory, glory. And we're going to get to the fall and the precipice that Solomon falls over. But Solomon is a type, right? Jesus is one greater than Solomon. But this is one of the key words of theology in all scripture, right? From dust to glory. And Jesus is a revelation of that glory. The sign of that work, the veil in the temple, is bodily resurrection, that fire from heaven and Pentecost, and that temple, the worship of God, going to the ends of the earth. What is your chief end? What are you teaching your children? What is their chief end? What is the purpose for which they exist? I, I pray that one of the first things that they learn is it's to glorify God. Even if it's a hard word to say, that you, they begin thinking from the youngest of age and that you are thinking even now that this is the purpose of my life. Please pray with me. Jesus, we thank you so very much for your word. Uh, we thank you for uh, the scriptures. We thank you for uh, bringing us as a congregation this month to uh, the life of David and Solomon and that co covenant and the revelation, the sign of that covenant being that glory being manifested uh, at the temple in Jerusalem. We marvel at the prophets after that temple was destroyed and after Solomon had, had bowed down and made many other temples and high places to uh, abominations. Uh, we thank you, though, that your purpose of redemption and the purpose of the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent continued forward. We thank you as the prophets' promises began to get bigger and bigger, that the glory of the temple that was built after Solomon would be greater than the glory of the former. And we marvel at how these things have been fulfilled by you, Jesus. And we pray and thank you that you have called each and every one of us to take up our cross and to follow you. Help us in that to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, remembering your teaching that whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? For whoever is ashamed of you and your words you taught, that you, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of him when you return in your glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. O oh Lord, strengthen us, give us eyes to see more clearly what we have been taught to pray. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.